Okay. All right. Our next section has to do with sewage. And so the uh, first set of s slides that you're going to uh, look at uh, might be sewage one. But there aren't too many sections. There's a sewage one, and then there's a, a TF for trickling filter one. And then the next set is uh, right out of the book. And uh, and actually, the first few slides I look at are going to come out of the book. So you might get those organized. The last set is the uh, solid waste. OK. And, uh, and uh, on the last page, I don't know, uh, did you get a last page that looked like this? I didn't intend to mail that out, but I think it did get mailed out. Uh, the very last page of the whole thing? Yeah. No. No, we didn't get it. No. We didn't get it. Okay, that's good. It looks like a lottery number or something. <laughs> I was just writing down some pages that I Xeroxed. Uh, but anyway, let's talk very briefly before we start looking at slides. Let's just talk about sewage treatment. You've got this sewage that's been uh, generated, gone through a, a sewage collection system. And I won't talk about the uh, hydraulics of uh, sewer lines tonight because uh, that, uh, my understanding is that was covered in the uh, hydraulics and hydrology and fluid mechanics. And... Uh, but when we do, uh, when we treat sewage, uh, we generally divide the uh, tr sewage treatment into uh, several types of treatment. And I noticed that your uh, the author of your book uh, divides the t types of treatment into what he calls preliminary treatment. And uh, a lot of people would call that primary treatment, but I kind of like his uh, nomenclature there, a preliminary treatment. And that's screening and grit chambers. And that's on, and you've got your book, so that's on page 8 to 15 of, uh, of the book on sewage. Page 8 to 15, he talks about screens and grit chambers. Then he gives, uh, you, you can design screens and grit chambers uh, pretty much based on hydraulics. Uh, you can't pass too much water through a screen. You get too much drag. And if the screen is too fine and you try to put too much water through it, you get so much drag force, the screen will fail. And uh, on a grit chamber, he mentions that the velocity is about one foot per second. What you do is you slow the water down, and you get it to uh, go about one foot per second. That's slow enough that the sand and bicycles and false teeth and things like that will fall out. But the organic matter will go on through. Now, sometimes you'll see uh, it's probably one of the few applications where you'll use a... Uh, a uh, Proportional weir. Have you, do you have you seen or do you remember hearing of a proportional weir? The weir uh, that's in hydraulics, and I'm not going to cover it. But a proportional yeah, weir. Another weir in hydraulics. Yep. A proportional weir has a cross section like this, and so when the water is shallow like this, uh, the deeper the water gets and the more cross sectional area, what it is is the velocity. It holds a constant velocity through the weir. So you get a constant velocity through the uh, through the uh, sediment through that uh, grit chamber, no matter how much flow you have. And so, if you're trying to maintain one foot per second, if you had a VNOS weir, you could run into some problems. But with this proportional weir, you can always maintain the velocity one foot per second, no matter what the discharge is. That's a proportional weir, and you'll see those on the end of grit chambers sometimes. Uh, then after you remove, and, and I think it gives on page 815, it talks a little bit about the efficiency. And if not there, there's a table further back that talks about how much removal of various materials you get with each stage. Then in your book, many people would call the screens and grit chamber primary treatment, and they would call sedimentation also primary treatment. Your book calls the screens and grit chambers preliminary treatment. And then he calls primary treatment sedimentation. And that's on page 817 of the book. And he has plain sedimentation and then chemical sedimentation if you can't get enough material to settle out. Now, in primary treatment, you're trying to get the organic matter to settle out. So here you got this sewage. And it's got sand and grit and all kinds of things in it, two by fours and floatable materials, leaves, and all kinds of things. So you're, what he calls preliminary treatment, the screens and the grit chambers, clean it up a little bit and get out the stuff that would destroy a pump for the most part. Then the primary treatment, that sedimentation there, the purpose of that is to remove the organic matter. A uh, sewage might have a, 
uh, 300 uh, milligrams per liter, 300 parts per million organic matter in it. Yeah, that's not very much. And uh, in fact, uh, if you divide 300 by a million and then multiply by 100 to get it in percent, uh, that comes out what? What is 300 divided by a million times 100? That's 0.03 percent. So you got 0.03 percent organic contaminants in there. So you got 99.97 percent water. Ivory soap, they bragged about it. It was 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. Sewage is 99 and 97 one hundredths percent pure. But the EPA doesn't look at it that way. <laughs> you know, when they tell you sewage is causing a problem, you can't tell them, you ought to see it if we discharge ivory soap out there. They won't go for that. Okay, but anyway, primary treatment would be sedimentation. But your purpose there is to settle out the organic matter. But it turns out that you can't remove the organic. It won't settle out in a reasonable length of time. <coughs> and it probably wouldn't settle out even in an unreasonable length of time. You know, it just won't settle out. So then you go to secondary treatment. Normally, secondary treatment is biological treatment. And the whole purpose for this is to get some organisms to eat that organic matter, to consume it as energy and building blocks, and to convert it to a solids that will settle out. So if you have a trickling filter or you have a, a, a activated sludge plant, you always follow it with a, a sedimentation basin. Because if when you put the... Uh, when you put the sewage in through a trickling filter or through activated sludge, it comes out with just as many, uh, nearly as many contaminants coming out as it had going in. But what you've done is you've changed the solids to something that will settle out. You've changed it from primarily uh, undigested uh, uh, food waste from humans to uh, waste from microorganisms, and this waste will settle out. So the last step in the biological treatment plant is another uh, sedimentation pond. And it, we would normally call that the secondary sedimentation. And uh, when you measure the efficiency of a biological treatment plant, you would measure it from the intake to the biological system to the uh, output from the uh, secondary clarifier or secondary sedimentation pond. And then on page 817 is trickling filter. Page 822 is activated sludge. Page 825 is the tertiary, or what I call tertiary, what most people call tertiary. Your, your author calls it advanced, and advanced is a good title. I really like his preliminary. I think I'm going to change what I call that. I like his concept of preliminary treatment. And then he has a little section on sludge disposal on page 826. And there's some problems on page 826 or immediately after that on sludge disposal that help you calculate the amount of sludge. And I could see that as being a, uh, a problem that might occur on a, uh, on a solid waste, on an exam having to do with solid waste. Because what do you do with the sludge that you produce? What you do if in a sewage treatment plant, you have this waste stream coming in with maybe uh, 300 milligrams per liter organic waste in there, maybe less than that. And uh, the rest is water. And what you do is you discharge the water with probably less than 20 milligrams per liter of anything in it, a total suspended solids or organic matter. And you have a sludge that comes out uh, that may be uh, 10 or 12 percent sludge. And uh, you got to dispose of the sludge. You put most of the contaminants in the sludge. You haven't destroyed the contaminants. You just put it in the form of sludge. So then the sludge would go to either an aerobic or an anaerobic sludge digester. And when it's digested, what this means is that it will settle even more. And you've converted a lot of the energy to methane gas if it's anaerobic. And you've converted a lot of it to carbon dioxide if it's aerobic. Uh, you've also produced a lot of carbon dioxide in the anaerobic process. Then you end up with uh, even less sludge that normally has to be disposed of by drying it and putting it in a landfill. So normally what happens to the sludge, you know, what happens to the solids and sewage? It normally goes to a landfill 
or it goes to a land uh, supplied to land as a soil amendment or a, as a well, soil amendment. You can you can work up a uh, application of sludge to land for beneficial uses. You can raise grass. You can put it around airports. Uh, small uh, in in Texas, uh, you know, many states, uh, counties and cities have airports, especially small towns. And they may have uh, several hundred acres with a uh, one airstrip on it. So uh, maybe 10% of the area is airstrip, and the rest of it's just land to get the clearance around the airstrip so you don't have houses and trees growing around the airstrip. You need to keep it mowed. If you don't keep it mowed, uh, weeds grow and, and then uh, bushes grow. So they have to keep it mowed. Well, most small towns have a tough time mowing 800 acres. <laughs> they don't have the equipment or the money. So what they can do is they can produce hay. They can a lot of contract get somebody to raise hay. But in the summer, they don't get much hay. And they get a lot of weeds. And uh, you can take that sludge and get a beneficial, get a permit to apply that sludge beneficially. We're talking about solid waste now instead of sewage. But uh, and you and you put that sludge on wet. You can plow it in. They have injectors where you can put it in the ground. But you're putting water in the ground. And it's not only a soil amendment, but you're adding water. You're irrigating. You get more grass. And uh, if that sludge has been treated properly, so you get what they call unrestricted use, then that means that farmers can use that hay for a cattle feed. And they do it. I mean, and this is a viable process. So this is one way to recycle the solids and the solid waste. And there's, there's many projects in Texas of, of this type. And the reason you do it is for airport safety. Uh, it keeps the grass mowed. You don't have trees growing around the runway. You have good visibility for the pilots, and you get rid of your sludge. Okay, uh, so let's uh, let's look at uh, uh, the first uh, handout is sewage one, and again I'm not going to read this. It's uh, mostly descriptive, and what they do is they give you a lot of numbers in there about the amount of uh, BOD that you're going to add per day and and all that. So we need to talk about BOD and. Uh, so I really misled you. I, I didn't want to go to sewage one. The next step was to go back to this chapter on wastewater, the one that's in your book. So you can turn to page 8.3. Just go back to the beginning. Go to page 8.3. It looks like this. And, uh, and uh, the first part is dissolved oxygen that we're going to talk about. Uh, you've got it there. And they give the they say the difference between the saturated and the actual dissolved oxygen concentration is known as the oxygen deficit. And uh, give equation eight one. And uh, I've written all of this thing and I can hardly read it. But uh, uh, the uh, equation eight two is the uh, equation that would show you. Uh, uh, what the oxygen deficit would be a little later if you put uh, if you put this uh, uh, sewage with an oxygen deficit into a river or into a body of water, what would be the oxygen deficit? Let's say one day later or two days later. K is a factor. Uh, in the book, he assumes a K factor of 0.12. That's the net gain in oxygen, taking into account the uh, oxygen depletion. He says equation eight two assumes that oxygen is not being depleted during the reoxygenization process. Well, I don't think that's r exactly true. What he means is that the oxygen being depleted is less than the reoxygenation, and he's giving you the constant that would be for the difference. Yeah. I, okay. Uh, so anyway, he, uh, in the book they use a 0 0.12, and, uh, and so if you came up with, say, a... Uh, uh, an oxygen deficit of 1 using 0.12 in 2 days the oxygen deficit would be down to uh, 58 0.58 it would have gone from 1 to 0.58 so the oxygen deficit remaining would be 58% of what it was at the beginning one day sooner uh, going on to the next page uh, uh, he gave two equations one a log base 10 the other one, log, uh, log base E, and so he shows you how to convert uh, from log base uh, 10 to log base E. And, uh, and then the biochemical oxygen demand, equation 
Uh, are you familiar with VOD? Uh, I don't remember it. Okay, okay. All right. We, we have to measure the strength of sewage. And so there'd be lots of ways to measure the strength of sewage. We could just measure the amount of uh, solids in there, the suspended solids or the uh, uh, total solids, express it in milligrams per liter, but there's all kinds of solids. You could have some gravel in sewage, and that's not going to cause much contamination of the river. It might cause a sandbar, but it won't cause a, a depletion of oxygen. Where, where, uh, where sewage causes problems in rivers is uh, dumping untreated sewage in a river, and it depletes the oxygen as the organisms consume the uh, the sewage is like fertilizer and so you get a lot of organisms in the river and they they use the oxygen to degrade the sewage and they deplete the oxygen supply and the fish die and if you deplete it enough you end up with a, a, a river that's anaerobic no oxygen at all a characteristic of an uncontaminated stream would be to have a a small population, but a diverse population. You got a few of everything. You got fish, you got turtles, you got snakes, you got a few worms, and you got flies, and you got a few of everything. A characteristic of a contaminated stream is that you got a large population that's usually the same thing. You know, the only thing you'll have is turtles and worms. <laughs> you know, the fish have died, everything else has died. So one way to measure the strength of sewage is to somehow measure what effect it has on the oxygen in a river, and that's what BOD is. BOD is the biochemical oxygen demand. So what you do is you take some water that you've uh, put the required nutrients, the phosphorus and the nitrogen that organisms need to live, and, uh, and you put oxygen in it so you know the oxygen. And so this BOD equation, they call it the five-day BOD, and we'll talk about why they measure the five-day BOD. One that thing is they wanted to measure it long enough to get a good measurement, but they had to uh, measure it short enough so they get the results this week. So five days was about as long as they could go and get a good result and short enough to get the answer back this week. So this is the uh, DO is the the DO at the beginning, and this is the dissolved oxygen in the bottle at the end of the five days. This is the volume of the sample. And this is the volume of the sample plus the dilution water. Uh, you can't put strong sewage by itself in that bottle because it wouldn't have any oxygen in it. So you got dilution water that's got a high oxygen level, and you put in this in this uh, example that they work a little later. They put uh, five milliliter samples in 300 milliliter BOD bottles. So the total volume would be 300 uh, milliliters. It'd be 295 dilution water plus 5 milliliters of sample. And then the 5-day BOD is equal to that. You, know, you plug, plug into that equation, 8.5. And what this does is it tells you how much oxygen was uh, consumed in milligrams per liter in that sewage. Now, if you look down at figure 8.1 on page 8.4, all uh, right, as you get these organisms growing, there'll be another little group of organisms that will start breaking down the nitrogenous compounds, and they'll have their own little demand. But usually when we measure BOD, we want to know the carbonaceous demand. So if you measure much longer than five days, you start picking up this nitrogenous demand, and you, and you don't know how much, you, you don't know whether you're measuring, let's say that if you went 10 days, you wouldn't know whether you're measuring this or whether you're measuring that. And the uncertainty would do you in. You got to know which it is. So uh, we usually measure five days. That's before the nitrogenous demand comes in. Now then, this curve, you notice this curve theoretically goes on, and theoretically it would reach the ultimate BOD. At time infinity, it would reach that value. And, uh, and that's predicted in equation 8 to 6. But if you use a a case of D of 0.1, the ultimate BOD can be found by using equation 8.7. And it's the BOD ultimate is equal to 1.47 times the five-day BOD. And that's a pretty good equation for, a, for, a, for sewage. Then you can also find, when you run the BOD, you run it at a temperature. Now, it may turn out that the temperature you ran in the lab is different than the temperature that you're going to discharge the sewage into the river. 
and it would be difficult to come up with one temperature because the river in the winter would have a different temperature than the river in the summer. So here's a way to convert that K uh, from one temperature to another. Uh, usually when we publish the results, no matter what we run it, we would like to report the results at a standard temperature. And so normally we would report it at 10 to 20 degrees Celsius or some standard temperature so that everybody would report them at the same temperature. Then we can convert them to whatever temperature we want by using equation 8.8 8, or a variation of that equation is 8.9. And, uh, and then they have some uh, values, typical values of uh, KD for uh, in table 8.1. And there's an example problem. But uh, the example problem is pretty obvious. Just plug in that equation 8.5. Uh, this uh, he has relative stability. Uh, have you have you seen any of the labs, the Corps of Engineers labs that y'all have for water treatment plants? Have you had a chance to see any of those? No, no, never seen any of them. Okay. Uh, the relative stability is uh, is the was the predecessor to the BOD test, and uh, and he discusses it. Uh, but the, the relative stability test isn't used much anymore except uh, uh, for, as a field expedient. But that means, you know, it could be used uh, uh, in a uh, situation where you had a, in a field. You might, you might run into it in an army manual using relative stability. What they do there is they put a die, they run it just like VOD except they don't titrate. What they do is they, they uh, put a dye in there, they measure the oxygen level that's in there, and they put a dye in there with the, with the sewage, and they put different dilutions. So they might put one milliliter, five milliliters, 10 milliliters, uh, 20 milliliters in this 300 milliliter bottle, and they put this indicator in there that's blue as long as there's oxygen in there. When the oxygen, when it goes anaerobic, it turns white. And so you can see how many days it takes for the oxygen in that bottle to go to zero. That's a pretty nifty test. And, uh, and uh, so they call that the stabilization time or the decoloration time. But the problem with that is you don't really have a BOD and it's difficult to change it. It's difficult to change it to another temperature or it's difficult to change it uh, to a, another time to come up with the ultimate BOD. Uh, but it is a test that you can use to control a sewage treatment plant. And I, I would be surprised if maybe it wasn't in one of the field expedient laboratories where they talk about, you know, you set up a well field or you set up a, a well point on the river to treat water for troops. Occasionally they'll set up a, a place to treat sewage, a, a temporary sewage treatment plant, and I would imagine they would use relative stability in a place like that. And it is a simple test to run because all you do is record the time from the beginning until it loses its color. Okay. Uh, the chemical oxygen demand, demand is another way of estimating the amount of oxygen that a river would use. But when we started getting industrial waste, if you have an industrial waste that's toxic to microorganisms, you can't run the BOD because the organisms won't live. So the chemical oxygen demand is a chemical means of measuring the, uh, you, you chemically oxidize the uh, waste. This is on page 86 of your book. And uh, so they put this thing in a flask with boiling beads and some uh, sulfuric acid and other oxidizing agents, and they boil it for several hours, and they completely oxidize the organic matter. And then they calculate the amount of, uh, of uh, oxygen from a chemical viewpoint that was used, and they end up with the results in milligrams per liter, which is, would be the amount of oxygen that would be consumed if you biodegrade, if you degraded the if you oxidize the waste chemically. Now theoretically, you should get, if for sewage, theoretically, you would get the same answer for both of them. But of course you don't, because one of them you're using biological means and the other one is chemical. The COD almost always gives a higher number. And he mentions in the book here on page 86 that the BOD-COD ratio typically varies from about 0.4 to 0.8. And this is, he says, it's a wide range, but it's normally fairly constant for a given sewage treatment plant. The advantage of the COD is you can get the result in one day. The BOD is going to take you five days. So if you can work up a calibration factor between COD and BOD for your plant, 
Then if you're on COD, you can get the uh, what the VOD is going to be four days earlier. And this is uh, this is handy if you've got a sewage treatment plant that's uh, where the discharge is going through some rapid changes, where you got uh, a sudden increase in organic load or hydraulic load. Uh, the chlorine demand is on E. I think we've discussed that uh, certainly to the extent that uh, that he discussed it. Uh, if you look, I mean, in the book on page uh, eight seven is that same uh, uh, same uh, curve that we talked about the breakpoint chlorination on page eight seven, and uh, he talks about grease and volatile acids. All of these are ways to measure uh, the strength of sewage. Uh, uh, grease is. Uh, really give you trouble in anaerobic digesters. And greases give you trouble on sand filters, uh, or I mean on uh, 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 anything. They clog them up. They, whatever it is, clog up pipes, clog up the system. So sometimes we would want to try to remove the grease ahead of time if we can. We would normally do this by putting in a, uh, a, uh, a stiff ordinance, require everybody that generates grease, like restaurants, to put in grease traps and to clean them every once in a while. On page uh, 8, 7, they talk about suspended solids. And so uh, if you look at that on page uh, 8, 7, uh, we have the total solids. In this case, he said the total solids is 100%. You can divide the total solids into dissolved solids and suspended solids. And you can make that determination by use of a filter. So in this case, 33% of the solids, this is uh, typical for uh, sewage, 33% uh, of the total solids are suspended. They would be caught on that filter, and 67% is dissolved. It turns out that a filter isn't perfect for separating dissolved solids from suspended solids. So of those dissolved solids, maybe 90% are true dissolved solids, and the others are real fine colloids, colloidal materials that you couldn't remove with a filter. The suspended solids are broken to 60-40% settleable and colloidal particles that will not settle. The settleable solids would settle, presumably, in your sedimentation tank. The colloidal solids wouldn't, and you'd have to go through and feed those to some organisms and convert those solids to something that's settleable, so they would settle out later. And then they, down below on that same page, he talks about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, refractory pollutants. That's on the next page. The first word on page 8.8 8 is refractory pollutants and these are these are pollutants refractory pollutants are solids which are difficult to remove by common processes in this case the term refractory is meant to mean stubborn rather than heat resistant it's just stubborn uh, it talks about the disinfection and we've talked about that it talks about the typical composition of sewage table 8.5 on page uh, 8.8 and uh, you notice the strong sewage is 1,200, weak is 350, uh, and uh, but that's total solids. If you look at the uh, the BOD, it's uh, 300 to 100 milligrams per liter. The total organic carbon, 300 to 100. Uh, chemical oxygen demand, uh, 1,000 to 250. Uh, he has the nitrogen, the organic nitrogen, the free ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, phosphorus, and so on. A grease, 150 to 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, the design flow, I won't go through, but uh, you go through it the same. Uh, I'd be on page 8, 8, and on the uh, same way you did for water. And uh, they have some numbers in there. Uh, go, skipping back to uh, uh, page 8, 9. They have uh, some uh, typical surface water standards. And table uh, 8 6. And uh, what they're saying here is that uh, water that's used for domestic use, you'd normally want your uh, minimum dissolved oxygen about 6 milligrams per liter. If you're going to have water contact recreation, you need at least 4 or 5 milligrams per liter. Uh, you really don't want people swimming and, and using water that fish won't live in. You don't necessarily have to have fish living in it, but I think you could see that if it, the water is such poor quality that fish won't live in it, you don't know whether you want to be swimming in it. Uh, they give uh, 
no no limit on the uh, dissolved solids, but they do give some limits on coliform. Coliform organisms are the uh, indicator organisms that grow in the human gut. They won't grow in the gut of warm blooded one warm blooded mammals. Some of them blow. Some of them have adapted and they grow in soil. But we use these indicator organisms because it's too difficult to measure the specific organisms that cause disease or to measure virus. So if we find a large number of organisms that grow in the human gut, then we suspect that the water is contaminated. And uh, so if you're going to use water, you'd like to have uh, maximum coliforms and none. If you're going to have people swimming in the water, uh, you're going to end up with coliform because people don't always behave themselves when they're swimming. Sometimes they discharge, uh, make illicit discharges while they're swimming. So you'll find that the, uh, they try to control the coliforms to about 1,000 per 100 milliliters. That's pretty low. Uh, a bird having an accident in a swimming pool would probably, if you uniformly disperse that, would probably result in more than 1,000 uh, uh, coliforms per 100 milliliters. And so then they have fisheries and so on. So if you're going to try, when the EPA set up the regulations, what they did first was set, set water standards, quality standards in the rivers. And then, of course, they found what they knew they'd find. There were people that were, there were, people that were discharging things in that river of poorer quality than they wanted the river to be. So then they issued a permit for these people to do an interim permit where they basically said, tell us what you're doing. So they sent in a report. They got the interim permit. And then uh, the EPA looked at all of these, picked out the people that were doing a good job, made those the requirement, and they went back and said, now, if you want to renew your permit, you've got to meet these requirements. And so gradually they cut down on the uh, level of the contaminants that you can dump into the river based on the water quality standards in the river. Uh, then they got some typical secondary effluent standards on Table 8.7. Uh, I wouldn't use these for anything except as a reference. They uh, uh, discharge maximum for BOD uh, uh, 30 and 45 uh, is pretty high. Those have been reduced to probably about 20 now. And uh, and suspended solids, uh, they got 30 and 45. Those have probably been reduced to about 25, 20 to 25. And uh, the coal forms are probably about the same. Uh, you notice that when they measure the coliform, they say the geometric mean is used, not the arithmetic. When you get the average, we use the arithmetic mean, but on that data that really has a scatter in it, like the uh, coliform, they use a geometric mean. And uh, if you don't know what a geometric mean is, you need to look that up in the statistics book. And uh, but but you won't have to calculate a geometric mean. Uh, on page eight and nine, they talk about the collection system, and they have the peak flows and so on, but I'm going to skip that because that, that was covered in uh, hydraulics. Let's go back now to page 8 to 12. And uh, there's a section there on dilution purification. And that's uh, probably a, uh, there's nothing wrong with the theory, nothing wrong with the problems. These are good problems. Might well have a problem like this. I don't think they would call that dilution purification anymore because the EPA says that Dilution is not the solution to pollution. They want you to remove that waste. But this would probably be more called dilution mathematics or something. We still make these computations, but we don't think of this as a purification <laughs> process. We think of this as something. But we, a city can't say, well, it's a big river and we're a little town. We're just going to dump this sewage in the river and depend on natural purification. The uh, the EPA says, no, we're going to act like you're a big city, and we're going to make you do the same thing that the big cities do. Okay. And uh, on, on uh, equation 823 is the, uh, is the way to convert this uh, KR, this uh, equation 822. Uh, if you don't know the uh, a KR value, they give some KR values down here, reoxygenation values in table 812. But they say you can calculate it if you know the velocity in the channel and you know the depth in the channel. Now, for depth, I would use the hydraulic depth. You remember on an open channel, I'm not going to cover open channel flow, but you remember on open channel flow, here's the water, here's the channel, there's an area, there's a top width, 
And so the hydraulic depth is the area divided by the top width. For depth up here, I would use the hydraulic depth. Okay? And for velocity, I'd use the average of velocity using Manning's equation. Okay, go to page, uh, let's skip 813, and let's go to uh, page uh, 815, and this is where, well, we've already covered this. This, this is the wastewater processes. We talked about primary and the screens and so on, so let's skip that. And, uh, and they give you a technique for designing trickling filters, and that's on page 817. And he has an example, and it's really good. I, I like it. But what he uses, and when I say but what he uses, I don't mean to imply there's anything wrong with it. He uses what he calls in Appendix A the uh, 10 states standards. Okay? And that's a real common approach. Nothing wrong with using it. But there's another common one. And uh, so if you'll go to the uh, handout marked uh, sewage one, Uh, uh, they talk about trickling filters. Let me get rid of this. This is the one marked sewage one. Uh, there's some s descriptive material about trickling filters, which is the same as pretty much the same that's in your book. And then they talk about extended aeration, where they give you some a table 421. They give you a little more details than he does in the book. Uh, about the loading on the aeration tanks, the food, this is the food to mass ratio, it's the pounds of BO, five day BOD per day uh, per pound of, this is the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. What you do is you'd filter the, you'd get a sample of the uh, mixed liquor, that's the, re, that's the uh, sewage, raw sewage coming in with the recycled sewage that you're putting with it, you'd filter it and you'd get the uh, suspended solids, and then you would uh, put it in an oven uh, at a uh, high temperature and uh, get the volatile solids. And so this is the mixed liquor, volatile, suspended solids. So it's just a solids measurement. And you get that ratio, and that's what they call the food to uh, mass, biological mass ratio. And so they give you some design values. Uh, they give you on page sewage three, uh, there's the average sewage flow. And uh, and then they give uh, some information on the bar screens and on aeration tanks, just like he does in your book, just a slightly different look at it. The rate of recirculation. And uh, so on, go to page four, and they give conventional, when you, if you had to design a plant, what you need, is something that will give you design numbers. What detention time are you going to use? Uh, what loading rate are you going to use? How many gallons per day are you going to put through a square foot? And so these are numbers like on racks, the 200% plus sanitary sewer. Uh, you know, for sanitary sewer, it's, uh, the, uh, the area is 200%. That's the area required for 200% of the flow plus the sanitary sewer. Uh, are 300 percent plus the combined sewer if you got water and sewage. Uh, 20 years ago, cities had storm sewers and they had sanitary sewers, and they would mix them. They would mix storm sewage with sanitary sewage. Then the EPA came out against that. Now the sewage is separated from the storm sewer. We have separate storm sewer systems from sewage systems. But turns out now the storm sewage needs treatment. So it's starting to go back to combining the system so they can treat the storm sewage. And uh, this table is probably a little bit out of date, but it's coming back in vogue because now we're starting to mix the systems again. And uh, then they have screens and they have grit chambers and they have skimming tanks and commoners, which are grinders. Uh, uh, they have uh, chemical precipitation, sedimentation. These are just design factors that would be handy in working a problem. Uh, the table five is a continuation, sheet sewage five is a continuation of that. Here's the drying beds. How much 
drying beds you need. It says one square feet per capita with plain sedimentation, one and a half square feet with trickling filter, one and three quarter square feet with activated sludge, and two square feet with chemical coagulation. And, uh, and if you glass cover it, then you reduce it uh, the area by 25% uh, because you eliminate the rainfall. And these are just, let's say these are uh, uh, sewage at six is more design data. Uh, it shows uh, how much removal you get from uh, sedimentation plus a sand filter. Uh, sand filters were used for sewage treatment uh, until about, uh, uh, oh, maybe 50, 60 years ago. Now we're using sand filters for tertiary treatment. Uh, sand filters make a lot of sense for, for polishing sewage after you get it. Uh, if we ever get to the point where we really have to reuse sewage as drinking water, we'll be filtering it and going through some other processes. Uh, that finishes that little section. Going back to the uh, your book, to uh, page 26, they show some final clarifiers for uh, table 815, which shows final clarifiers for activated sludge process. They show the design flow in million gallons per day and the minimum detention time in hours and the maximum overflow rate. The overflow rate. If a tank is going to handle uh, uh, a thousand gallons per day, let's say I'm just making up a number, a thousand gallons per day, and it has an area of two square feet, then you're putting 500 gallons per day per square foot through there. And that's the overflow rate, even though there's nothing overflowing from that, <laughs> from that sedimentation tank. They just take the tank, no matter what the geometry is. They take the surface area and divide that into the flow rate, and that gives you the uh, overflow rate. And it's uh, an effective way to design a tank by, li by giving you limits on the overflow rate. That's normally, we normally design these things hydraulically, just based on the flow and based on past, perform past performance. On table 816 down below, he gives you some uh, uh, typical characteristics of domestic sewage sludge uh, when it comes out of the plant. And this is the one that I suggest that you follow the example problems on 826, 827. Uh, on page 827, there's a whole step, probably example 88, of estimating the amount of sludge. And uh, example 88 on page 827. And uh, uh, that might be a handy thing to do on a landfill design. But it's straightforward. Okay, now then, let's. Uh, our time is about up for the sewage. Uh, they do get on page 837 and 838 in your textbook. They show you some typical layouts of the various types of sewage treatment plants. And on page 838, they show some tertiary treatment, the third stage. And then on. Uh, Right here, they show the drying beds and going to landfill or burial or incineration in ash landfill for the sludge. That's on page 838. You recall for a while everybody was incinerating sludge and they were dumping it in the Atlantic, the people on the East Coast. When they shut off dumping the ash or the sludge in the Atlantic, all of a sudden, they ran out of places to put that ash. Uh, one of the problems with burning sludge is that the sludge is not a hazardous waste. But when you burn it and you get this ash and you concentrate it in a, you know, maybe into a 10 or 15 percent of the weight that it was to start with, if there were any metals in there, if, there, if you burned a battery by accident uh, and you run these tests, the material all of a sudden can become a hazardous waste. If it's a hazardous waste, it's going to cost you more to dispose of that little bit of hazardous waste than it would have cost you to treat all the sewage and everything else. So 
incineration is not in vogue anymore like it was because you can't get rid of the ash and you can't dump the sludge in the river. You've got to put it in a landfill. So you're finding a lot of sludge that's making its way to the arid states where they're shipping the sludge by rate by rail to West Texas or New Mexico or Arizona for s disposal in a landfill. Which brings us then to the last topic. We're about on schedule, and that's solid waste. Just while you're looking for your notes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. How in the world can they actually treat the stormwater? I mean, that comes in such a volume. Yeah, it is a problem. That's about the only chance would be to mix it with sewage. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it would just overflow the plant. Uh, well, of course, what you can do, uh, you know, I guess what the intent is on treating stormwater, the intent is to uh, keep the surface clean mm -hmm. so you don't get it contaminated. So, uh, you know, it, on a, if you have a construction site that's greater than five acres, you've got to get a permit from the EPA to control sediment. And, uh, and all you're doing to get that permit is you're acknowledging that you understand there are regulations. You don't send them the plan. You just send them a notification that you've got a construction site more than five acres, and, hey, I know there's regulations. Then if they catch you in violation, they can fine you about $25,000 a day per violation. And you've already admitted up front that you've read the regulations. And they probably don't even read it. They just send you a, that we've received your notification. And then when you finish, you send them a notice that you're finished. And if you finish before they ever see you, then you'll never see them. And But the intent of that is to keep the sediment from getting in the river. And uh, and what you're saying is that you won't, if you got a construction site where you got bulldozers and you got scrapers and you got fuel and you got oil and you got oil filters and changing oil, you're saying that none of this stuff, will, none of this oil will be in the water. A sheen is a violation. So if an inspector happens to go out there and sees a sheen, then you violated the Clean Water Act. So that means that they're going to put dikes around the, uh, around the, uh, uh, fueling locations and they're going to watch what they do because that fine is rather ha hefty and under the Clean Water Act uh, anyone can turn you in and they get a percentage of the fine so they got bounty hunters that are out looking for this uh, one, one organization turned in the EPA and the state of New Jersey and an industry and they their share was four million dollars you're kidding and, uh, and so they're on lookout for more of these so that's the way to treat uh, stormwater runoff is to prevent it from getting contaminated in the first place. Now let's talk about a landfill and go to a SW-1 which is not in your book. These are the last pages. These are the last pages. Last pages. SW-1. <laughs> That's bad being the only guy in class. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't turn to that page, I, I browbeat you until you do. <laughs> hey, I'm turning, I'm turning. Uh, okay. Right. Okay, if this is the natural ground, normally the landfill, you dig a hole. And, and you put solid waste in it, you cover it up, and then you build a final cover. You're going to have a liner down here, and you're going to have a final cover on top. You've got solid waste and daily cover in here. When you build the liner, there's a clay fright. You're going to have a clay liner. Under the new regulations, you're going to have a clay liner. It's going to be a minimum of two feet deep of clay. And on top of that, you're going to have a, a membrane liner, flexible membrane liner. And the thickness there depends on what the, what the liner is made out of. It's a high density polyethylene it's 60 mil as I recall and if it's uh, low density it's 30 mil and, uh, and on top of that you can have a leachate collection system which you might think about as a fabric or sand with some collection pipes like French drains to collect the leachate then on top of it you're going to have pretty much the same thing you're going to have a, a two foot minimum of two foot clay cover. You may have a flexible membrane liner and then you'd have and I say may 
because it's going to depend on state to state. It's going to depend on the climate. And they haven't closed many of these yet, <laughs> so the issue is still in doubt. But more than likely, it will turn out that you'll have a membrane liner on top, be forced to, not because of reg regulation so much, just to, in order to do what you say you're going to do. And then you'll have topsoil on top of that, and then you'll have grass growing. Now, the little problem with this, when you didn't have a flexible membrane liner on there, the methane that you produce, this thing is going to produce gas. And gas comes off, it's about 50% methane, and it's about 50% CO2. And when you just had a soil cover on there, the methane came out and you didn't have any problem. You put this thing in a case where it's impermeable, the methane can't get out. <laughs> It might blow up. I don't mean explode. It might just blow up like a like a big tent, and uh, and so you had to put in a methane collection system, and then vent the gas. Now people have tried all kinds of things for methane collection systems, and you'll see pictures in textbooks of methane collection systems where they just put in pipes, and they put in a pipe in a in a sand bed like a sewer line where the, theoretically the methane gas comes through the soil, gets in that gravel, goes in that pipe with a hole in it, and then just vents to the surface, and that's it. Uh, to my knowledge, none of these have worked without a forced draft. Somehow you're going to have to put in a pump or a compressor. If you don't pump that gas out, more of it, if, if, if you didn't have, I don't know what will happen with the membrane, but with a soil liner, with those uh, methane gas collection systems that didn't have a pump, more gas still escapes through the gas than you through the soil than, than you collect it. So I, you know, I'm certain from an engineering viewpoint, I'm certain that you're going to have to put a forced draft. Now, there's ways to get a forced draft. You can use a compressor. You can use a pump. You can also use a, uh, you can burn. You can flame it. Sometimes that might give you enough draft if you put enough burning points. But if you're going to reuse the methane, then you can't be burning it out there in the flare, so that would mean that you'd have to pump it. So I would guess that when you put in a methane collection system, you're going to have to put some type of a pumping system. You design this just like wells. You'd have drawdown, and if you, uh, with, with, the, with this liner up on top, it'll really help because if you over pump these things and pump air into the landfill and get oxygen there, the, the organisms that produce the methane are uh, what they call obligate anaerobes. Oxygen kills them. And so if you kill the obligate anaerobes, you don't get any methane. So if you over pump the methane and kill the organisms that produce it, you've just uh, not done yourself a, a very good favor. Now uh, the si solid waste 2 on top shows a uh, final cover. It shows the topsoil. It shows sand. This would be the equivalent of a leachate collection system. This so would be the rainwater that went through get that sand, you'd have a slope on this thing, and you'd have this uh, synthetic liner. And the thickness of this liner might be thinner than the one on the bottom. Because you can replace it. If something happens to that liner, you can replace it, but you can't replace the one on the bottom. And then you've got a clay liner. Two foot thick. Okay? And then below there shows the leachate collection system. And this uh, LCRS is leachate collection and removal system. And then here, this is a single composite liner system. Here's where you have the composite liner. You got the leachate collection system. You got the soil, and then you got the natural soil. And this is what's required on Subtitle D regulations for municipal landfills. This is the current state-of-the-art liner for municipal solid waste liners. Uh, for hazardous waste you would have two of these synthetic liners. You'd have the leachate collection system, and you'd have a leachate monitoring system, and then you'd have the clay liner under all of that. Going to uh, sheet uh, three. Uh, there's a nice little write up there on methane uh, recovery. You can uh, read that, but they point out, they give the energy content methane gas, the way it comes out with water and carbon dioxide in it, 
has about 500 BTUs per cubic foot compared to 1,000 BTU for commercial gas. It has a specific gravity of less than one, which is kind of nice in that the landfill, when it escaped the soil, since it was light and airy, it just went right on up and it didn't. Uh, there have been surprisingly few methane problems in the state of Texas. Now, in California, they've blown up houses and people because they built houses right up adjacent to landfills in a dry climate, like in Los Angeles. And they built these landfills in, uh, in uh, natural canyons that were uh, three, two and three hundred feet deep and then built houses on the flanks and they had these porous materials and so they got methane gas coming up and going into the basements and they blown up houses. But in Texas we haven't had that problem because most landfills are in clay, it's wet, that stops the flow of methane. The methane comes out through the top and disperses. We have had several uh, serious accidents caused by methane gas from landfills. In one case they built a building on top of landfill unknowingly and blew up the building. And in another case, uh, uh, both of them, oddly enough, were service stations in two different towns. The town forgot the landfill was there, and they put a sewer line through the landfill with the sand bed under the pipe and ran it to the service station and blew up the service station. In one case, they killed <coughs> the man at the service station. In another case, they severely injured him. And it was a case of the city itself forgot the landfill was there and basically piped methane gas to the service station. That's incredible. Yeah. And uh, so as a result of that, in the regulations now, the EPA requires that uh, that you uh, clo when you close a landfill, that you uh, have an, uh, you, you file a, uh, an affidavit to the public that goes becomes a permanent part of the record of that land. So if you sell that land, right. any time there's an affidavit to the public saying that that was a landfill or any kind of a waste disposal site, sewage treatment plant, whatever. Uh, then he points out that if you remove the water and you remove the carbon dioxide, that you can uh, that you can get this uh, get a BTU content up to uh, 900 or 1,000, about what commercial gas is. But it costs you something to do that. And uh, going on to uh, sheet four, uh, he says it must be kept in mind that uh, methane in the presence of air is explosive at concentrations between five and 15 percent. Uh, below 5 it won't explode and over 15 it won't explode. But 5 to 15 it gets exciting. And uh, so we're required to monitor for methane gas at a landfill. We can't let it go outside the property at uh, between 5 and 15 percent. Uh, we've got to, they, uh, we normally monitor for uh, uh, 25 percent. We don't have any problems as long as we find it on the site at about 25% of the lower explosive limit. You'll find that the limit is based on the lower explosive limit. They don't, EPA, <laughs> naturally, and I don't blame them, would not consider it safe if you got the methane content of higher than 15% because it could get diluted and explode at that point. Now then, methane gas going through a, a grass cover uh, sometimes kills the grass. You'll notice the grass will die sometimes on landfills where you have a lot of methane gas coming out. But the methane gas isn't toxic to the grass. What kills the grass is as the methane goes through the soil, it sparges out the oxygen. And the oxygen is replaced by methane. And the plant can't live without oxygen. But the methane itself really isn't uh, toxic. And he points out that uh, gas monitoring control must be included in planning, design, operation, sanitary landfill. And you've got to actually, in a permit application now, you've got to actually have a section on how you're going to uh, collect the methane and what you're going to do with the methane. And then uh, you got to prevent lateral migration of methane to buildings, tunnels, manholes, sewers, and other things. And, uh, and uh, you can't, you, you can reuse, uh, you can build things on top of an old landfill, but there's a couple of things you can't do. You can't destroy the monitoring wells, you can't destroy the cover, and uh, you've got to let the uh, regulatory agency know and you've got to design the building so that uh, you can't get methane gas in it. What you can do is build a building where you don't have anything on the first floor, where you only have the second, and third, and fourth floor, and you have the first floor uh, uh, open for parking and so on, so you don't get methane gas, and where you got good circulation of air. But the uh, regulatory agency would want to review your plans. 
Uh, on table 5-1 is the approximate composition of residential waste in 1977 and 1989 based on a, on a study published in the EPA journal. And uh, you notice there's food waste, paper. You notice the paper has gone up. Food waste has gone down. Uh, the amount of waste has gone up. I imagine the amount of food that we throw away is about the same, maybe even more than we throw away. But we're throwing away a lot more of everything else. So the food waste has gone down. Uh, so what does that chart do for you? Well, you need it <laughs> to work some problems that they give you sometime. You know, right now recycling okay. was interesting. So uh, they give you this, they give you hypothetical waste streams and say how much paper can you recycle. Okay. So, you know, or how much, uh, you know, we used to recycle. Back when we were poor, we used to recycle. Well, I lived in Denver in the uh, late 50s and in the late 50s we couldn't put food waste in a garbage can we had to put food waste in a paper sack and put it on top of the garbage can and the city used it to raise hogs that they used to feed guys in jail and uh, oh. and you couldn't let it freeze if in the winter you had to put it out just before the garbage truck came if you let it freeze the guy would open it up and look at it. If it was frozen, he'd dump it in your yard. He wouldn't take it because the frozen food caused the uh, ulcers in the pig. Uh, but uh, then people got out of the habit. You know, they got out of the habit of recycling. But people used to recycle all the time. People used to use that food waste for uh, for uh, animals and so on. So uh, a lot of this food waste also goes down the uh, garbage disposal now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, except uh, cities have started moving against that because it's been so hard on the sewer stream plants. Uh, there was a time when you could buy those uh, disposals, and you still can, but some cities have ordinances against them now, and they won't let you put them in because it overloads the sewer stream plant, and they'd rather put that food waste in a landfill. Where it really ought to go is back to the pig. Back to the pig. <laughs> and then put the pig waste in a landfill, maybe. Although there's been some research done in El Paso, they took. Uh, pig waste and they were making dog food out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so don't eat dog food. <laughs> now then on, on page five shows the projection of average, average composition of solid waste by year from 1970 through the year 2000. I assume they're guessing at year 2000. And then they give some typical properties of uncompacted solid waste is discarded in Davis, California. And they give the mass, and they give the density, and they give the volume. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, page six is a typical composition of municipal solid waste percent by mass. They say the food waste ranges from six to twenty-six percent by mass. Uh, the uh, typical is fourteen percent. Davis, California, eight point three percent. Merida, Venezuela, it's 27.4%. I don't know why they put that in there. Uh, the EPA prepared this, and they probably had a column available, and they had to fill it up with something. Now on seven, page seven, here's typical data on moisture content of municipal solid waste components. So the food waste, the moisture content is 50 to 80%. Typical is 70%. And then down below, they have the uh, estimating the moisture content of solid waste sample. Uh, yeah, this is a problem, example 10 1. And, and I don't necessarily need to, we've got time to go through part of this problem, but they do some things in solid waste. You know, in soil mechanics, water content is the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids. In solid waste, environmental engineers apparently did did this and they did it like they do sludge and here water content is the weight of the water divided by total weight and so when I looked at this problem this problem of 10 1 and they gave you this uh, they got food waste 15 percent papers 45 and they want you to estimate the water content of the entire waste stream and I went through and looked at the computation and uh, and I didn't get their answers because if you, and what I want to point out to you is that if you collected some samples, let's say that you were collecting samples uh, on a military base, 
and you sent them to a geotechnical lab, a lab run by civil engineers, they would tell you the water content based on the weight of the water divided by the weight of the solids. If you sent it to an ag lab, they would tell you the weight of the water divided by the total weight. I would suspect that there's a good chance that the EPA is defining it this way and everybody else is defining it another way and they just nobody really realizes that they're doing it wrong. So I would really be careful. But here they say there's, there's two tricks in this problem. This is an interesting problem and I recommend you go through it because I have seen this problem in, in the, uh, this kind of problem in the review notes. Apparently people are suspicious that this kind of problem is going to occur. But this example problem, he put in, he didn't put them in deliberately, but there's two tricks that would uh, do you in. This first table, he did it based on a 100 kilogram sample of waste. On the next one that he did, which is part of the same problem, he changed it to a 1,000 kilogram sample of waste. On the last table, he went back to 100. And then, as I say, they do the water content they do the water content based on the total weight instead of the dry weight. I would have missed that problem on the exam. I would have used, I would use water contents 100 minus 79 divided by 79 times 100, and uh, they use this. Presumably their data is correct. I mean, presumably that's what they did when they collected the data. I'm sure the EPA data is done in accordance with this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that anybody else's data is done this way. Because most of the engineers that work on solid waste problems, at least in Texas, are geotechnical engineers. The landfills are designed by geotechnical engineers. Water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants are designed by environmental engineers. And, uh, and most of the labs that would do this kind of work are geotechnical labs. Anyway, he shows you how to get the water content. He shows you how to get the density. And uh, the density... Uh, he sets up a table, and that's on sheet nine. And so, uh, in this case, the food waste is 15 percent. It's based on a thousand kilograms, so 15 percent of a thousand kilograms gives you the the uh, 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 volume, which would be a uh, looking for wrong one. Uh, you got 15% mass by weight. So 15% of 1,000 is 150. And the typical density of this is 290 kilograms uh, per cubic meter. That's given. That was on a previous table. And then the volume is equal to the 15% of 1,000 divided by 290, which would give you the volume in cubic meters. In other words, the mass uh, in kilograms divided by kilograms per cubic meter gives you the volume in cubic meters. That's how he got it. He took this from the previous table. He took this from another table for typical densities and came up then with the volume. And, uh, and then you get the uh, overall density by just dividing the thousand kilograms by the uh, total volume. So you know that the total sample weighed a thousand kilograms and then you can divide it by the 11, by the total volume and that would give you the kilograms per cubic meter. Then he gives another typical densities for solid waste components and mixtures where he gives the range and typical densities in kilograms per cubic meter and uh, that's where the two, this is where that 290 came from. And this uh, this came from the table on the previous page on page 8. And then going on to page 10, he has a table showing the uh, table 10-7, so showing typical data on inert residue and energy content. So if you were to burn this solid waste or digest it chemically, you'd have 2 to 8% ash with typical ash content for food waste being 5%. And the energy level is 3,500 to 7,000 with a typical value of uh, 4,650 kilojoules per kilogram. 
and, uh, and so there's a table. And then example 10.3 is to estimate the energy content of the solid waste. Well, on this table, you just take, oops, I'm not there. On this table, you just take what's in column one times what's in column two, and you get column three, which is the total energy, and add it up, and that's the total energy. And, uh, and, uh, and then you can compute the uh, uh, energy content uh, the energy content on a weight basis, which would be 14,740 kilojoules per kilogram, or you can determine the energy content on a dry, dry basis by taking the uh, water content that turned out to be 21%, and so then you can calculate the amount of water there. So you had 100 kilograms of weight, but 21 kilograms of that was water. Deduct that, and now you end up with 18,658 kilojoules per kilogram on a dry basis. And then you can do it on an ash-free basis by removing the ash. Just talk about what can be burned. And you'd end up with 19,919 kilograms. And that concludes everything that I planned on covering. How do you like that? That's a little better. That's a little better. Now, I, uh, do you, <laughs> you have any questions? Back on example uh, ten one. Okay. I don't see where that dry, where the dry, how they get the dry mass in kilograms. Okay. Let's go back to that. Ten one. SW eight. Oh, it is SW eight. I must have skipped it then. Yeah, you skipped over the SW nine. Yeah. I understood yeah. that one. That was no problem. Okay. All uh, right. Okay, uh, this one, this table here, is that the one? Is that the table you're mystified by? Yes. Okay. All right, on yeah. this one, on this one, this first column, he says it's 15%. And so yeah, those are given. Yeah, well, okay, it's 15%. That was given. The moisture content right. was given. That's 70, but you don't see I'm where he got, th you don't see where he got this. Right. Okay. The way you got that is uh, if you got 70% water, then that means you got 30% dry, right? So right. take 30% 30, 30 of uh, 15, I believe is four and a half. Uh, Check that out. 30% of 15? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's right, 4.5, yeah, 3 yeah. times 15. Yeah. So 0.7 times 15 now, is... Had you done, had you done the water content, and, that's, and I was mystified by this too, if you if your definition of water content was weight of water divided by weight of the solids, the way you would get the dry mass would be to take the 15 and divide it by one plus the water content expressed as a ratio divided by one plus 0.7. So you take 15 and divide it by 1.7, and that would be 8.8. .8. I mean that is a significant difference. See if you did it based on the way the geotechnical engineers do water content, uh, the dry mass, uh, the water would be 8.8 .8 subtracted from 15, which would be 6. You get 6.17. But the way they say to do it, the 4.5 is equal to. Here it is. Just yeah. drop. Yeah. Just drop that in there. There's yeah. what he's talking about, Rob. Mm -hmm. In effect. Right. He says he's got 15% of 100 kilograms is solid stuff. Right. And 70% is water, so 30% is mass. 70% is water, so 30% of it is not water. So then that results in uh, 0.15 times 100 is 15 times 0.3, which is 4.5 kilograms of mass. Mm -hmm. So I see, I see where it comes yeah. from too. I didn't yeah. get that the first time either. Yeah. Well, because uh, most engineers would have done it the other way. Well, it's not that so much. Yeah. It's just we got 15%, yeah. we got 70%, we yeah. got but we don't have any hundreds in here. Yeah. But the hundred is kind of hidden down yeah. on the bottom of right. the table. Right. Hundred yeah. kilograms. Right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and this came out of uh, this came out of uh, I didn't take this example out of uh, there's a solid waste book by an author named and I can never pronounce Shablankas, and it's it's the book that everybody uses. 
Okay. Because everybody uses somebody got mine and I didn't have it. But this these examples came out of that book. I would not be surprised if they gave a problem like this that it wouldn't be like this problem. And so you really want to watch those tables because he used a hundred kilograms, then the next step he used a thousand, then he went back to a hundred. And in my opinion, they do the water content in a strange way. Now if you if you're not a geotechnical engineer and you're not the uh, an environmental engineer, then it's just a way of doing water content. You probably don't see anything wrong with it. Doesn't matter. Huh? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay. Any other questions? Well, that gets me going. Well, it's been a pleasure doing business with you. <laughs> see you, Rob. Okay. Good luck. All right, thanks. Well, I All probably right, won't see you it. tomorrow, so good luck uh, Friday. Okay, thank you. You gonna let us know? Uh, how long will it take for you to get the results? It's a pretty long time. Supposed to be three to four months. Yeah. Well, I guess you'll they let us three, know. They say three months. Yeah. I, I guess you'll let so, us know. Uh, around July or so. Mm -hmm. I'll send you an email. All right. Good. Sounds great. I got It'd you. It'd be good to hear from you as a registered engineer. <laughs> okay, good. Good. All right. Well, you'd be on top of the world. A captain and a registered engineer. What couldn't get better than that? Oh, I don't know. Sure, he could, he could be airborne. Oh, <laughs> give me a break. I am airborne. What do you mean? You are. All right. Is that right? Is that right? I'm not. I mean, I was. I used to be an 80. I used to be an 80. I used to be an 82nd airborne division. Me too. Look at here. Uh -oh. Zoom in. Now we gotta have a zoom in. Zoom in. Find it. He he's trying. He's trying. It won't fit. Yeah, well, I'll walk over there. We played that game. <laughs> I don't think you can see it. Not enough light on it. You, you need to put it underneath that document camera that you need to do. There you go. You're, gonna, you're yeah. destined to show yeah, it. Yeah, I've got to show this. I'll tell you what I'll do. <laughs> oh, else fails. <laughs> All right, now put it on the ground. There, there a little more. There it is. Slip. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I was in the 82nd. 1948. You got to see your wings there, huh? Yeah. yeah. I got my senior wings before I left, too. Mm -hmm. Where did you, when did you go to jump school? Oh, 89. I went through in uh, 48. <laughs> a little bit different, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, it was seven. It was seven weeks, and we got two pair of wings. We got glider wings and the uh, parachute wings. Oh, that we, right. We were yeah, glider, right. glider qualified as well as. Uh, I mean, uh, not flying them, just riding in them, <laughs> loading you cargo. Were the, you were. You were in the three two five then. No, nah, they just gave everybody went through jump school. Went through both sets of training. And so what did they oh, do? I see. What did they do? Were you, at, were you stationed at Fort Bragg, though, in the 82nd Airborne Division? I was stationed at Fort Bragg from January of, well, not January, about May of 48 until uh, Thanksgiving of uh, 1950 when I went to Korea. Which, in, which unit was that, though? I was in the 505th Airborne Regimental, uh, 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 Airborne Infantry right. Reg Regiment. Right, 505th, right. And yep. then I was, which, in the, uh, what? I was in Fox Company. And then I was in the uh, Pathfinder, 82nd Pathfinder platoon. Oh, wow. Which, uh, they didn't have battalions back then? It wasn't a whole regiment? Yeah, it was a whole regiment. Uh, we first had the battalion. I was in the first battalion. Uh, wait a minute. Fox Company was 2nd Battalion. I was okay. in 2nd yeah, Battalion. They don't have Fox Companies anymore. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, I supported I supported 1st Battalion. Uh -huh. I was in the 2nd Battalion. And at that time, the 3rd Battalion was the all black they were the only black air they, they were the they had been in the uh, in the only airborne army regiment that won a presidential unit citation without going overseas they fought fire spires in world war ii and they won right, a, right. they won a presidential unit citation for fighting fires and they broke them up and made them the third battalion of the 505 and then when they integrated they just you know they where were, but they had a they had a black airborne regiment. And so you're telling me you really got those wings for being certified by sitting in a seat and strapping down in a glider and letting somebody <laughs> else fly it around? What, what kind oh of no, we had to load. The, no, we had to load the glider. We had to load the glider. <coughs> tie things in and calculate. So was it? Uh, 
Were they well, still the Panther done. Brigade back then? What's that? They still call, were, you, were, you still, were you the Panther Brigade back then? The, no, they wasn't Panther Brigade. It was the, our, we, we wore a regimental crest that had a Black Panther on it. Yeah, that's what they, see right now, the uh, H minus is the, uh, is the slogan. Yeah, right. Uh, I still for, uh, for the 505th. Yeah. And uh, they call themselves the Panther Brigade. Was it, we were the 505th uh, Airborne Infantry Regiment. Right. See, now they also got the 504th uh, per, uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. They had the 504th. Uh, yeah. When I was there, right. they had the 504, 505, and the 325. Uh, same thing. Same thing. Mm -hmm. 504 is uh, Devils in Baggy Pants, and the uh, 325 is they're the Glider Regiment. They, uh, they're, uh, their, their slogan is Let's Go. Yeah.